Um, nevertheless, we'll, we'll carry on as he would want us to do, which will be easy with Dr. Shin, continuing from last week. I just want to make uh, Sorry, I missed the first one. Uh, uh, I hope you do well from Bruce Talbot, Bill and Mildred son is there. Uh, secondly, although it's Thanksgiving weekend, next weekend, we will have a session on December 1, and it will be the last of the series. Uh, thirdly, there's a health survey over there. Phil has come up with a number of interesting ideas for 1997, and he would like assistance if you could comment and uh, uh, any additional suggestions you might want to make. As you know uh, from last week, because I think most of you were here, Dr. Shin did an extraordinary job in putting a very interesting face on genes, chromosomes, DNA, and gene splicing, uh, which I really thought everybody enjoyed. And we're going to continue uh, moving more to our second section, which would be uh, ethical uh, and decisions. And in the spirit of Pasquale, which he mentioned on a short list of both great scientists and great theologians, Dr. Schiff. Well, thank you. I had a good time uh, here last week, and I'm uh, pleased to be back again. And uh, especially glad to see uh, David Reed, a uh, friend whom I've esteemed for many, many years. Now, uh, last time we sort of opened up the subject when we'll look at the meaning of all this for our self-understanding. Today, we're going to deal just with uh, decisions. Now, uh, first, uh, who's going to make the decisions? Well, our society and everybody in it. Uh, scientists will make some. They'll uh, decide uh, what uh, they want to work on, uh, uh, what they want to promote, uh, what they think's worth doing. Uh, drug companies will make some. There are vast investments in this, and uh, they're deciding day in and day out uh, what they'll do. Health insurers will make a lot. What is going to be covered by your health insurance uh, policy? That's already a lot of headaches, and there'll be more. Uh, government will make many. As a government must authorize the putting into practice of uh, some of these things, or prohibit them. And families will make some, and that maybe you individually will. Uh, uh, I would guess that all of you have friends who have made such decisions. You might not know about it. Uh, they don't usually uh, publicize them. But uh, uh, I know uh, I've had uh, many who've uh, made these decisions, and uh, you probably have some too. We're going to look at uh, eight kinds of uh, decisions. The first has to do with diagnosis. That is, it is now possible to diagnose certain ailments in ways that we couldn't do in the past. Now, this is not always possible, or many we cannot diagnose, but increasingly we can. And the simplest cases are what are called monogenic. That is, there are certain traits that are the consequence of a single gene in the body and we are learning week by week to diagnose some of these. Uh, not very many yet. Most we cannot. But a few we can, and the number's increasing. Uh, the diagnosis might start with a parent or prospective parent. That is, you have some reason to think, because of a family history, that uh, you might be harboring a deleterious gene that does not hurt you because it's recessive. But if you and your partner both have it, then there's one chance out of four that a child will have it. So you might ask for a diagnosis. Now, uh, nobody's asking for a diagnosis of uh, everything uh, possible, uh, and uh, as the possibilities increase, uh, this will become uh, more and more unlikely. But again, if there's something about a ha family uh, history, uh, you, you, you might uh, do that. Now, uh, diagnosis is not a cure. 
you find out that you've got this uh, problem, uh, what can you do about it? No treatment as a rule, but uh, you might decide that you two should not have children. Now I mentioned uh, Tay-Sachs disease last time, which is likely to be prevalent among Ashkenazi Jews. Various ethnic groups have their liabilities, we'll come to uh, some of ours uh, later on. And uh, increasingly, couples contemplating marriage are getting the diagnosis. Again, they are entirely healthy, but they might be carrying the gene. And if they find they have, that both have it, they've got to make a decision. If they, they could take, could have children and figure uh, the odds are in our favor. But it is such a disastrous disease that most people don't want to take a one out of four risk. They might decide uh, to uh, marry but not have children. They, they might decide if they're not married, uh, we will regretfully uh, not go ahead with this marriage. We'll uh, look for uh, other uh, partners. And uh, there's been a drop, I think I mentioned last time, of 80% in Tay Sachs in this country in one decade, 1970 to 1980. I don't have the figures yet for the next uh, decade, but uh, 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 drop in this uh, very disastrous uh, disease. Now, it is becoming increasingly possible to diagnose also the fetus and see if it has the ailment. Now, if it does, uh, what can you do? There are rarely any treatments. Uh, this is gradually changing. Uh, there's starting to be a medical treatment of the uh, fetus, but uh, in most cases, uh, that's uh, not uh, possible. Well, abortion's a possibility at that point. And uh, we know how uh, controversial abortion is in uh, our society uh, already. It, uh, in this particular case, now I I'm not going into the big subject because that's uh, a subject for at least a period uh, on its own, but uh, I would say that in a society where abortion for any reason is uh, possible, this is a better reason than a lot of others you could uh, think of. And uh, the problem with it is it comes a little late in the fetal development. Now, uh, one method is uh, amniocentesis. You put a needle in and get some uh, fluid out of the uh, amniotic sac and uh, you test it. Another is a uh, chorionic uh, villus uh, sampling where you uh, get something out of the umbilical cord and uh, just on November 1st, there was an announcement of a new method of testing the mother's blood because some of those fetal uh, cells get into the mother's uh, blood. And uh, this is uh, just uh, experimental, but it may uh, come along soon. Uh, amniocentesis, you don't get the result of till the 14th or 16th week. Uh, chorionic villus sampling a little earlier. The new blood tests as early as 10 weeks if it uh, proves uh, feasible. Now, the question of fetal development is interesting here because if you take even the best, the 10 week, the embryo is already visibly human, has a discernible uh, face, uh, uh, full complement of organs, measurable brain activity, capable of spontaneous movement, although quickening as the movement that the mother actually feels comes uh, just a little later. By the 12th week, the uh, brain structure is essentially uh, complete. And uh, at that uh, stage, a, uh, an abortion is a more serious thing uh, than, uh, say, a morning after uh, pill, uh, something uh, very, very uh, early. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, problems with this. Worldwide, the most frequent reason for abortion after a fetal test is that the, the fetus is female. This is uh, 
the most frequent reason, uh, reason in uh, China and in India. And they're the two most populous uh, countries in the world. It is not a frequent reason in uh, this country. It has happened. Uh, it is happening. And uh, a great many people who uh, more or less reluctantly would accept abortion would not uh, like it for that reason. That is, uh, being uh, female, a uh, disease that uh, warrants uh, destruction of the uh, fetus. Uh, some doctors will refuse to do it for that reason. But uh, you can always go to another doctor and not tell the reason. Uh, you, you can uh, get around that. Uh, uh, some doctors in uh, testing the fetus will refuse to disclose whether it's male or female. But that's a doctor's decision. And uh, again, uh, there will always be other doctors who won't. So uh, uh, that, that's uh, one of the issues that comes up. Here's a recent issue of the, uh, the journal, The Christian Century, In Search of the Perfect Child, Genetic Testing and Selective Abortion, by uh, Ted Peters, a, a West Coast uh, theologian with whom I've uh, worked a lot on, uh, on uh, this uh, subject. Uh, there is no test that is going to assure you a perfect child. And the last time I said, uh, never say never, uh, I'm about to say there will never be a test that will uh, assure a uh, perfect uh, child. All right, uh, those are some of the issues connected with diagnosis. Uh, second, I come to genetically designed drugs. I just put drugs there. I'm talking about the specific kind, genetically designed drugs. I think I mentioned last time that insulin, which uh, usually we get from cattle, can now be taken out of a human being. You have to get just the least little bit, developed in bacteria, so there are a lot of them. And you have a uh, drug, which uh, for some patients is a better than uh, getting it from uh, cattle. And uh, this is not uh, very controversial. Now let's come to one that is controversial. Human growth hormone. This comes out of the pituitary gland. It can be made into a drug administered to people, and it will increase their growth. There are still some arguments about its efficacy, and then more about its desirability. Now, if a person is a dwarf, uh, that is uh, very uh, obviously uh, uh, small in uh, stature, uh, you can see how it might be uh, an advantage to uh, grow to a normal height, whatever uh, normal uh, is. Now, uh, the problem uh, comes up here. Uh, most people, I won't give one of the reasons, most people would rather be uh, a little bit above average height. Look how our language reflects this. Stand tall, ride tall on the saddle most likely to be a little above average. And there's no way, unless in Garrison, Keeler's Lake, uh, Wobegon, uh, where uh, everybody can uh, be above uh, average. Uh, the, the classical case is pulled out is that of the, uh, the uh, basketball player who could never quite make it in the big time because he's only six feet four. And uh, he wants his uh, son to be a good six feet uh, eight or ten. Uh, uh, gives a little uh, growth hormone, and uh, turns out the kid doesn't really like basketball, would rather be a violin player, has got to uh, drag that extra height uh, through uh, life. Another part of it is uh, the cost of the treatment is twenty to $40,000 a year. I don't know for how many years that uh, continues. And so uh, a lot of people are not going to be able to uh, get this. Uh, well, it's, it's just, you see, an example. I'm not trying to cover the water for I'm just giving examples of the kind of uh, issue that arises. Now privacy. You get some tests and you discover that uh, you are harboring uh, an ailment that uh, isn't bothering you too much now, but in uh, 10 years will be uh, very uh, serious and uh, there's no known treatment. Who has a right to know this? You and your doctor. Uh, that's inevitable. Your spouse, your employer, your uh, insurer, 
the agency that issues uh, driver's licenses? You might say no. Uh, the agency that issues uh, pilot's licenses for airliners? Uh, you might say yes. Uh, who, who has a uh, right to know? Now, l l let me give you a, an example, not out of genetics, of how complicated this is. Uh, I learned about this at a conference at the uh, New School for Social Research on AIDS. Who has a right to know if you're HIV positive? We usually say that's your business and no nobody else's. Does your spouse have a right to know? Well, now, normally, you would tell your spouse. But uh, some people won't. Should the doctor who knows you have it tell your spouse? Well, what about an unmarried uh, sexual uh, partner? The law is uh, a little complicated uh, here. Generally, the doctor is supposed to respect confidentiality and not disclose this. Not tell even your spouse. But if your spouse is a patient of the same doctor, then isn't the doctor uh, obliged? You see, the doctor could be sued. Let's say it's the, uh, the male has it. The doctor could be sued by the male for breaking privacy, could be sued by the female spouse for not giving me proper medical care. And the law hasn't uh, worked out that uh, conflict. And uh, you know, law is always, though valuable, a rough instrument of uh, justice. And uh, we don't know what will uh, come out of that. Now, the comparable things you see can come up in the case of, uh, of uh, genetic liabilities. Uh, but most of them are not transmissible in the uh, way that, uh, that the HIV is. Uh, look at the case of the insurer. An insurer, uh, say if it's life insurance, uh, has a right to uh, ask uh, certain questions about your uh, health, maybe expect an examination. How about uh, an insurer demanding uh, a uh, genetic uh, test? Now, uh, we, we, we kind of tend to say no. Uh, look at it from the insurer's viewpoint for a minute. Here's a uh, healthy uh, person who uh, never bothered to get life insurance, uh, who's uh, too healthy to, uh, to uh, worry about it, Fi suddenly finds out, I've got a lethal disease that'll catch up with me in a couple of years. Oh, I'm going to go get $200,000 worth of insurance, just like that. Now, no insurance company can handle very many cases like that without jacking up the rates uh, for everybody, you see. And so insurers, well, the, the old rubric was, uh, no, I'm not talking about uh, sh shifting now to health insurance. You, you get the case of life insurance. The same thing comes up with that health insurance. The old was, uh, the insurance did not cover you for pre-existing conditions. And we're saying, well, look how hard this is on uh, a whole lot of people. Uh, we're beginning to require that insurers cover for pre-existing uh, conditions. Uh, uh, and again, no single insurer can afford to take too many high-risk cases. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is one reason that uh, justice requires that eventually health insurance become universal. But this is very controversial in our society. But you see, if it's universal, those risks are shared by all of us. Uh, you get something a little like that if uh, you're insured by your employer with a big body of other people, because you're one of uh, many and your risk is, uh, is uh, spread out. But it's the uh, person who's not covered there and not covered by uh, Medicare or uh, Medicaid, they've just got to get an individual policy uh, that uh, the insurer is uh, worried about. They could then not promote them, or do, and it can really hurt them 
you know, as they try to progress in their career. Mm -hmm. Both, both from, from then you have what you do have then is a sick person, yeah. and then a person that will not have the economic advantage of a salary to take care of themselves if the corporation decides to let them go. So it's, it's double. It's a very bad situation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a uh, uh, right to the point. Uh, I'll carry on uh, this uh, with the next one uh, in a minute, but uh, uh, for the moment, uh, uh, still on the privacy, the uh, military is proposing to take DNA tests of every soldier with the idea that uh, it can identify uh, dead bodies uh, in, the, in combat. And you know, the, there are all kinds of methods. They use teeth and, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, if the body's mangled beyond recognition, the, the DNA test would make it possible. And then the people get uh, worried, uh, will this leak? In this day of uh, internet, you know, uh, you never know what you're going to uh, uh, find uh, browsing around here. And so uh, that one's uh, still not uh, quite settled. And notice how easy it is to get samples. Uh, just go to your barber shop and, uh, or the uh, person's barber shop and uh, pick up a uh, little swatch of hair uh, off the floor and uh, you can uh, get a DNA test on that person. So uh, confidentiality is going to be a big issue here. Uh, let's move next to criminal law. And uh, the O.J. Simpson trial has uh, made DNA tests a uh, matter of uh, common discussion. Now, the DNA tests have, in a good many cases, identified criminals, uh, beyond doubt. In perhaps an equal number of cases, they have exonerated suspects. So don't uh, think it's all one-sided. Uh, there have been cases of men actually imprisoned for crimes, and then a DNA test showed that person was not guilty of that crime. So this can be an advantage. And uh, you know, uh, by and large, I'm for accuracy in identifying uh, criminals and in uh, identifying uh, innocent accused people. The uh, questions come up of how accurate they are. And for a while, this was debatable. By this time, it's almost certain that they are as accurate as fingerprints if done in a, an ideal laboratory. There must not be any slipshod lab work here. But uh, if it's a, a, a really reliable uh, laboratory, uh, they are very accurate. Now, it's harder to explain this to a jury, because everybody knows what a fingerprint is. Well, you take your own. Uh, you've probably had it uh, done. Uh, a DNA test, you are relying on the testimony of an expert. And uh, so there's an element of uh, trust involved there that's uh, not involved in fingerprints. Uh, I think we'll get uh, in the uh, habit and uh, come to take that uh, for granted. But there are decisions ahead there. Now the question of patents. This is extremely controversial. Uh, let's start at an obvious point. If the government puts out a lot of our taxpayers' money to fund research, then some corporation shouldn't come along and uh, patent that and uh, cream off the uh, profits. That's clear enough. Uh, shouldn't even, uh, by adding some tiny gimmick that wasn't government funded, uh, make a profit on what was mainly a public uh, investment. But uh, one of those cases where corporations, as they're now doing, put uh, millions of dollars into research, develop a drug or a process, and uh, patent it. The uh, case against it is partly uh, just a common revulsion. Uh, uh, you got a patent uh, life, uh, human life spent on this uh, globe for uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, years. Uh, now you're going to come along and patent this that, that you certainly didn't make. Well, no, you're not going to patent all that. But uh, there's a kind of a just inherent uh, feeling that this isn't appropriate. On the other hand, I've been growing patented uh, roses uh, for years. Uh, 
They cost me a dollar more than the uh, unpatented one until the uh, 17 years is up, and uh, then it uh, drops uh, a little bit. And I don't begrudge the uh, hybridizer uh, that. Uh, hybridizer probably did a thousand uh, crosses and got uh, one uh, successful one. Uh, uh, it, it gets more serious with drugs because you're making profit from people in need. And uh, maybe they can't afford the high price. Should they be denied this? so that you may uh, make a uh, profit. Now the case for it is that some of these do involve big investments. I said uh, millions of dollars, and sometimes uh, you do maybe uh, 10 investments like that, and only one of them will uh, turn out to be uh, worth anything. Now, if you're gonna stay in business, you've got to get back your uh, costs. The uh, patent is good for uh, 17, uh, years. Uh, in the case of drugs, I believe it was recently increased till 21 because there's a, often about four years between the war to the patent and the getting the thing to a market. They want to give them uh, 17 years. And then it becomes a generic drug. And I suppose all of us have used generic uh, drugs to uh, save a little money over the uh, patented uh, one. And uh, so uh, you, you can make a uh, case for it. And uh, it does contribute to the progress of medicine. And if you're not going to allow it, uh, you've got to find some other way of uh, funding the research. Another advantage of a patent is the patent requires disclosure of the information. You've got to put that on the file with the government, and it's uh, available uh, everywhere. Other people cannot use it without making a contract uh, with you. But the information is available, and anybody can uh, build on it. If you don't have a patent, the temptation is much greater to try and keep it secret. So uh, this is going to be uh, argued out at uh, great length. And you see, I'm not uh, giving you the answers on uh, all these uh, questions. I'm uh, giving you some things to think about. All right, so we've, we've come up to the economics of this. Uh, twice, in the case of the insurers and the case of uh, patents. Who's going to pay for these expensive treatments? Uh, only the wealthy and the rest not get them? That's been true through most of history. But we didn't have such effective treatments as now, so it, uh, it, it gets uh, where it hurts more. Uh, the insurance companies, we've talked about that. Uh, Medicare? The constant arguments, uh, what should Medicare cover? Uh, there's some other uh, dilemmas. You see, pick you and me, when any specific case comes up, so-and-so is denied treatment because it's too expensive, we want the system to be generous. And every time Congress walks up to a specific one, they say, yes, let's cover that. We don't want to be accused of uh, denying this uh, treatment to uh, people in need. But in general, we want to reduce the soaring costs of medicine. Uh, they're now at about 15% uh, of the gross domestic product. I do not say that's too high. I'm not going to say 20% would be too uh, high. Uh, uh, I know it can't be 80%. Uh, you, you've got to have something left for food and clothing and uh, shelter and education and uh, all the other things a uh, society uh, does. Uh, and uh, you see, everywhere around us now, not just on genetics, everywhere, we're, we're in this dilemma. We want a greater generosity on a uh, lower budget. And we'll do the best we can with uh, increased efficiencies and uh, so on. But uh, the, the quarrels are there uh, in the press every day. Uh, drive through uh, baby deliveries, drive through mastectomies, uh, uh, so on, and uh, immediately we, we abhor this and want them included. Now, if we vote to include them, we are probably voting for higher taxes. And uh, people are always wa want to vote for lower taxes and more benefits. And uh, we're going to work this out, a lot of tugging and hauling, compromises. But what I'm pretty sure of is we can't have it both ways all the time can't constantly be more generous at less expense. Let's see how we're doing. Ooh, I better hurry up. Uh, 
I come to a direct genetic therapy. Now here, uh, I uh, prepared the way a little bit uh, last time. It is now possible not simply to devise new drugs, but to intervene in the human body to modify the genetic structure within the cells of the body. Now, uh, everybody's got a few genetic liabilities. Uh, most geneticists say uh, four or five is about uh, average. And if uh, mine is astigmatism, uh, I'd rather wear glasses than have somebody uh, messing around with my uh, genes. Uh, if I uh, had Alzheimer's, not that we have a, a genetic cure for it, but if we did, I might uh, say, gee, I'll take the risk. You know, uh, if something might go wrong, I'll, I'll uh, take the uh, risk. And uh, that's, uh, we're, we're going to do a lot on that. Now, the complexity of the thing is part of the problem. A single human gene <coughs> may influence 10 or 20 different functions in the body. And you get a way to eradicate it to help one thing, you may hurt other things. And that's why this uh, must move so cautiously and uh, so uh, 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 slowly. Uh, most ailments also, I already said, are polygenic. Uh, an estimate uh, 95 to 98 uh, percent. It's reckoned that 63 genes determine the color of a mouse. Now, I don't know why anybody is uh, greatly concerned to change the color of a mouse, but there are comparable things in your own body. And uh, so uh, you say, oh, I get rid of this gene. Uh, well, uh, it takes uh, 63 to uh, really do what you uh, want. Uh, but uh, there are some therapies in which you insert enzymes into the bloodstream or remove bone marrow cells, alter them, and replant them with the hope that they will reproduce. It is, I say, extremely complex, and all kinds of things can go wrong. But the National Institutes of Health gave permission for the first cautious experiments in gene therapy in 1990. The point man was uh, Dr. W. French Anderson, with whom I've had a little uh, contact, and uh, he is a fine person, uh, really concerned about human healing. Within five years, more than 60 experiments were underway. There have been no reported disasters. The results are still described sometimes as obscure, sometimes as promising. Out of all those 60, uh, there's one case that seems to be a clear success, but you never know when there's spontaneous remissions and uh, so on, uh, so you can't be uh, really uh, sure. But uh, that's a big area for the future. And now the uh, last one, germline therapy. And that is the explosive one. That is, what I've been talking about is genetic intervention in the body which affects the somatic cells, you remember we talked about those last time, does not affect the germ cells. So uh, if you, you get cured, but if this is in your genes, you can still pass it on to your descendants. Germline therapy, if successful, will root it out forever in uh, the case of you and your descendants. And uh, that, barring uh, unknown liabilities might be a great advantage. Now, here's how it's done. You could remove sperm and ova from human beings, treat them. Now, remember last time I said uh, this fertilized ovum's about a millionth the size of a pinhead. Uh, this is uh, not something you do in your garage shop. Uh, uh, you, you, you might do that. Then work out the fertilization in vitro, implant it, all that's been done, and uh, if everything goes right, uh, have a uh, baby without the uh, affliction. The other way, again, would involve in vitro fertilization, but instead of the sperm and the egg, uh, the fertilized 
egg up to the stage of eight cells. That's just two, three days. Uh, because the cells haven't started to differentiate. And anything you change then will uh, be changed in everything uh, in the uh, body, including uh, future uh, sperm and uh, ova. This has never been done on human beings. There have been some experiments on uh, mice, never been done on human beings. I do not know anybody who thinks it should be done now. There are some people who think it should never be done. That's just too much risk at stake. Uh, the uh, Methodist discipline, for instance, seems to say it should never be done. Uh, the Roman Catholic Catechism uh, does not say that. Uh, it uh, edges up to it and does not uh, take that step. You see, it could be a great advantage. Uh, we have not by genetic methods, other methods, apparently eliminated smallpox forever. I say apparently because you never know when there might be a mutation and start over again. But uh, uh, this is a lot better, you see, than everybody having to get vaccinated for uh, smallpox. Uh, uh, this could happen genetically. Now, the risks are momentous. And I repeat, nobody that I know of thinks it should be done now. Uh, notice one peculiar moral characteristic of it. In medical experimentation, we usually use the criterion of informed consent. You want to perform an experiment on me, you should explain it to me, and I consent before you do it. Well, there is no way that the unborn infants from, for generations to come can give informed consent to this uh, experiment. But on the other hand, None of us gave informed consent to being born. None of us gave informed consent to the uh, heredity uh, we've now got. So that can't be uh, an absolute. OK, uh, those are the decisions. And uh, it's uh, time to uh, stop for uh, questions. Uh, uh, there's some other things I'd want to do, but I'll, uh, I'll get them next time. Uh, what questions do you have? Ron had asked a question last week about genetic food. Would you repeat the question? Yes. Um, what effects on us will the genetic engineering of our food supply have? Yes. We know, for example, giving too many antibiotics to animals, the growth hormone can have effects on, on us. Yes. So what about the future of genetics? Yes. Uh, one of the most uh, publicized was the flavor saver tomato. And it turned out not to taste as good as uh, they'd hoped and uh, hadn't, hadn't been a great success. But uh, th this sort of thing is, uh, is being done. Now, you mentioned the, uh, the hormone that enables uh, cattle to produce a lot more uh, milk. Uh, <coughs> some people are demanding that their milk be certified as from cattle who were not treated that way. Uh, most of the time, you can't tell. And, uh, with surpluses of milk in this country right now, uh, it seems a little uh, unnecessary. Uh, a Monsanto Chemical is one company that's producing this. And I heard an executive of Monsanto defend it, saying that on a world basis, uh, this could do make a real contribution to solving the uh, hunger problem. At present, it is legal. And uh, there are controversies about uh, whether we should do it or not. But, uh, the, 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 well, there was a recent uh, experiment modifying the genetics of cotton to produce a new kind of cotton with some of the characteristics of a polyester. Uh, it's, it's authentic cotton, but it doesn't uh, wrinkle uh, the way uh, most cotton does. <laughs> and uh, you know, we might all be wearing that sort of thing uh, one of these days. Yeah. Well, uh, in the case of wheat and improving grain, yes. Yes. Now, you see, uh, 
uh, all the, uh, the miracle grains that have unquestionably uh, increased the world's food supply, uh, almost all until very lately, were done by conventional methods of hybridization. You see, you, you cross two plants and hope to get the uh, best uh, variety, the best qualities of uh, both. And uh, uh, 99 times out of 100 you don't, but the one out of 100 uh, works. And uh, see, you, you can afford to do this with uh, plants, not, not with human beings. You wouldn't want to try something that uh, would be successful one out times out of 100 uh, with human beings. Uh, uh, you see, uh, how our moral sensitivities vary here. Uh, plants, one thing. Uh, uh, fruit flies. That's the favorite subject of experimentation because you can get several generations in a week uh, and uh, you move uh, fast uh, with uh, fruit flies. Uh, so they're doing that all the time. Uh, uh, mice, I said last time an awful lot of the human genes are in the mice and so you experiment <coughs> there. Uh, dogs, oh no, uh, you know, you don't want to mess around and uh, flush uh, 99 down the drain for one that'll be uh, better. And human beings, hey. It's, uh, but yes, we are moving from the normal process of hybridization to uh, these genetic transplants. <clears throat> Taking all those atheistic looking at them as a entirety, if you had the prognostic date, say 50 years from now, I don't know how many will be alive, what do you think the results will be? <laughs> <laughs> what do I think the results will be 50 years from now? Uh, I am old enough to remember uh, 50 years back. And my expectations of the world are in many ways so different that uh, I'm uh, not going to uh, nibble much on that. This presents a problem of the nature of democracy. Democracy rests on the assumption that ordinary people can elect representatives who are competent to decide uh, the uh, way the political processes uh, should go. Well, now. Uh, Congress people must vote on all these questions. And uh, what they do, they, they set up a committee and it hires a staff. And the committee takes the word as a staff and the Congress does or does not take the word of the uh, committee. But it uh, really makes you wonder uh, how we're going to decide these. And see, every ethical decision, other than just a platitude, uh, like be good, every ethical decision requires knowledge of the situation as well as a moral sensitivity. And you can't do without either. And if you la lack the moral sensitivity, you just turn it over to the experts, uh, they'll decide. And we know often they'll decide wrong, they'll decide what's best for them, not for us. You do it uh, without the scientific information and uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, we uh, vote uh, good instincts and they turn out badly. So this is going to be a real problem for democracy in the uh, next uh, 50 years, to take your uh, figure. Uh, we have an organization, the National Academy of Science, that helps. It's a government-sponsored, chartered organization, but not government-run. And uh, they appoint panels to make recommendations on issues like these. But you know, when it comes down to uh, my privacy, I don't want to know what some experts uh, think I should uh, have uh, confidentiality on. I want to know what I believe. But I don't want to make up my own mind unless I look through some of those things I never thought of before. It's going to be an interesting uh, time. Yes. Uh, I uh, know a uh, geneticist, Bentley Glass, quite distinguished one, who thinks that every church should have on the staff a genetic counselor uh, uh, comparable to the uh, 
Spargan as choir director. Uh, uh, I don't think that's the way it's going to go. <laughs> but uh, what one trouble is, information gets out without any kind of counseling. See, uh, suppose somebody, uh, you know, uh, you, you get these mail-in kits that are advertised for some purposes, and uh, I get one of those and uh, get the report back in the mail, uh, I've got a, a devastating uh, disease in the uh, offing. Uh, it'd be better if I were told this by somebody who could hold my hand and say, now, uh, there are these things we can do. Uh, the, uh, the communication of this is a big uh, problem. I mentioned uh, Nancy Wexler, I mentioned her last time, a uh, Columbia University woman whose mother had Huntington's disease and since the gene is dominant, not recessive, this means that the daughter is at 50% risk for it. It doesn't strike until ages uh, 35 to 45. And she's a young woman. Well, she was highly motivated to work on the discovery of a test. Uh, they found the gene that was located on chromosome 21, I believe it is, and uh, they found a test. But well, then immediately she said, let's not have this test administered except in a context of support for people. And she will not tell you whether she took the test herself. Because would you rather, you know, this is a good many years to come, uh, know that you're going to disintegrate, not just die, go through a painful disintegration of the nervous uh, system uh, some predictable time, or would you rather not know? Uh, my guess is that she, being the scientist that she is, would want to know, but she won't tell you. She says, I'm entitled to some privacy. Just a hmm. quick question. What would be the, the, the five or six top university research departments or health institutes in the world that you say are most advanced? Oh my, uh, because of the Human Genome Project that I mentioned last time, there is a coordination of these activities. And uh, I forget which chromosome uh, Columbia is working on. All right, Caltech's not going to work on that one. And so you can say Columbia's ahead uh, on this one and Caltech's ahead on this one and MIT on another one. Uh, uh, it, it's been a good example of uh, cooperation. And uh, oh, you, you, you think, uh, I, I don't know which of the European ones, uh, well, Cambridge is where the double helix was uh, discovered. Uh, but in this country, you think of uh, Columbia, Harvard, Chicago, uh, MIT, Caltech, uh, University of Cal, Berkeley, uh, and I'm probably leaving out some very good ones. Now, next week is a final uh, session. The topic was understanding yourselves. Would you like to say a couple sentences about what you intend to do? Oh. Well, I intend to get up to uh, some of the questions you uh, asked uh, last time. Uh, what does this really mean for our self-understanding? At what point in these uh, interventions into the course of nature are we playing God in an arrogant way, uh, building towers of Babel? At what points are we carrying out a legitimate uh, ministry of uh, healing? Uh, what does this have to say? Sir.